listening to Living with ADHD and CPTSD, available on Apple and wherever you get your podcasts. everybody and welcome to another episode of Living with ADHD and CPTSD. Today's episode we're going to talk about ADHD and we're going to talk about something a little different this time. Um, This is times when it may not be ADHD. It could be another a bunch of other conditions or symptoms that may be similar and so I'm going to discuss all the possible uh, dis- uh, um, issues that could come up that may think or make you think that you have ADHD or that your child has ADHD, but in reality is very possible that it could be one of these other um, issues. And I'm actually going to go further into whether it's autism or whether it's ADHD. And keep in mind that sometimes and this is actually a lot more frequently oft um, common now than back in the day, is you can have both autism and ADHD. You can also have some of these other symptoms of uh, issues as well with ADHD, but there are at times when you go and you get your assessment or when you go to see a doctor, there are times when this, when it may not necessarily be ADHD, so, I'm going to read this article and basically go through it and discuss. And then at the end, I will try to discuss my own uh, issues that I have where sometimes you think it's ADHD and then it turns out that it may very well not be. Okay, so I'll start now. So, conditions that mimic ADHD. Children are readily readily diagnosed with attentive attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD due to sleeping troubles, careless mistakes, fidgeting, or forgetfulness. The CDC cites ADHD as the most commonly diagnosed neurobehavioral condition in children under 18. However, many medical conditions in children can mirror ADHD symptoms, which can make getting a correct diagnosis difficult. Rather than jump to conclusions, it's important to consider alternative explanations to ensure an accurate diagnosis and treatment. So, bipolar disorder and ADHD. The most difficult differential diagnosis for doctors to make is between ADHD and bipolar disorder. These two conditions are often hard to distinguish because they share several symptoms, including mood changes, outbursts, restlessness, talkativeness, and impatience. ADHD is characterized primarily by inattention, distractibility, impulsivity, and physical restlessness. And then bipolar disorder causes more severe shifts in mood, energy, thinking, and behavior. While bipolar disorder is primarily a mood disorder, ADHD affects attention and behavior. The differences. There are many distinct differences between ADHD and bipolar disorder, but they're subtle and may go unnoticed. ADHD is generally first noticed in children, while bipolar disorder tends to develop in late adolescence or early adulthood, although some cases may be diagnosed earlier. ADHD symptoms occur continuously, while bipolar disorder symptoms are usually episodic. Bipolar disorder symptoms may not occur during periods between episodes of mania or depression. Children with ADHD may experience difficulty with sensory overstimulation, like transitions from one activity to the next. Children with bipolar disorder typically respond to disciplinary actions and conflict with authority figures. Depression, irritability, and memory loss are common after a symptomatic period for people with bipolar disorder and can even be found in people with ADHD. However, these symptoms are often secondary to symptoms related to attention and concentration. 
moods. The moods of someone with ADHD approach suddenly and can dissipate quickly, often within 20 to 30 minutes. The mood shifts seen in bipolar disorder last longer. To confirm a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, a major depressive episode must last for two weeks, while a manic episode must last at least one week with symptoms present for most of the day, nearly every day. The duration may be less if symptoms become so severe that hospitalization becomes necessary. Hypomanic episodes or less severe manic episodes generally last a few days. People with bipolar disorder appear to display ADHD symptoms during manic episodes, such as restlessness, trouble sleeping, and hyperactivity. During depressive episodes, symptoms such as lack of focus, lethargy, and inattention can also mirror those of ADHD. However, people with bipolar disorder may experience difficulty falling asleep or may sleep too much. People with ADHD can have similar sleep issues due to hyperactivity and restlessness, but they're more common with bipolar disorder. Children with ADHD tend to wake up quickly and become alert immediately. They may have trouble falling asleep, but can usually manage to sleep through the night without interruption. Behavior. The misbehavior of children with ADHD and children with bipolar disorder are usually accidental. Ignoring authority figures, running into things, and making messes is often the result of inattentiveness, but it may also be a result of a manic episode. Children with bipolar disorder may engage in impulsive behavior. They may demonstrate grandiose thinking and take up projects that they clearly cannot complete at their age and developmental level. Only a mental health professional can accurately differentiate between ADHD and bipolar disorder. If your child receives a bipolar disorder diagnosis, primarily, primary treatment often includes psychostimulant and antidepressant medications, individual or group therapy, and tailored education and support. It's normal for treatments to be combined or frequently changed so they continue to produce beneficial results. Now I will go into autism a lot more detail, but I will just go briefly over it. Children with autism spectrum disorder often appear detached from their environments and may struggle with social interactions. In some cases, the behavior of autistic children may mimic the hyperactivity and social development issues common in children with ADHD. Often behaviors may include emotional immaturity, which may also be seen with ADHD. Social skills and the ability to learn may be inhibited in children with both conditions, which can cause issues in school and at home. Okay, next is low blood sugar levels. Something as simple as low blood sugar, hypoglycemia, can also mimic the symptoms of ADHD. Hypoglycemia in children may cause uncharacteristic aggression, hyperactivity, inability to sit still, and inability to concentrate. Then there's sensory processing disorder. Sensory processing disorder, or SPD, can produce symptoms similar to ADHD. SPD is marked by under or oversensitivity to touch, movement, body position, sound, taste, sight, and smell. For example, children with SPD may be sensitive to certain fabric. They may fluctuate from one activity to the next, and they may be prone to accidents or have difficulty paying attention, especially if they feel overwhelmed. Sleep disorders. Children with ADHD may have difficulty calming down and falling asleep. However, some children with sleep disorders may display symptoms of ADHD during waking hours without actually having the condition. Lack of sleep causes difficulty concentrating, communication, communicating, excuse me, and following directions. It also creates a decrease in short-term memory. Hearing problems. It may be difficult to diagnose hearing problems in young children who don't know how to fully express themselves. Children with hearing problems have a hard time paying attention because of their inability to hear properly. Missing details of conversations may appear to be caused by the child's lack of focus when in fact they simply can't follow along. Children with hearing problems may also have difficulty in social situations and have underdeveloped communication techniques. And then there's kids being kids. Some children with an ADHD diagnosis are actually misdiagnosed 
and don't have ADHD or any other health condition. They're simply being themselves, such as easily excitable or bored. According to a 2012 study, the age of, of a child relative to their peers has been shown to influence a teacher's perception of whether they have ADHD. Researchers found that children who are young for their grade level may be misdiagnosed with ADHD because teachers mistake their normal immaturity for ADHD. Children who, in fact, have higher levels of intelligence than their peers may also get misdiagnosed with ADHD because they grow bored in classes that they feel are too easy. So the takeaway is ADHD is a common condition in both children and adults. However, if you feel like an ADHD diagnosis might not be correct, continue to seek help. It is possible that you or your child have a different condition altogether. Okay, so yeah, um, there's numerous different things that can occur uh, that are very similar and act like ADHD symptoms, but the only person or... You know, yeah, the only person who can truly give an accurate diagnosis is a psychologist or a doctor who is really, you know, well-versed and well-educated when it comes to ADHD. A lot of times parents can take advice from or a recommendation from a teacher that's, you know, like a person that's obviously around their, their child um, on a daily basis during school years and notice things that they see in other children. And so they're going to go and talk to the parents, say there's a possibility that this, that your child may have ADHD because they are displaying a lot of symptoms that are ADHD related. And it is my recommendation or my suggestion that maybe you should look at getting your child diagnosed and see if they do have ADHD. Now, it's obviously easier said than done because not every parent is just going to automatically believe what the, what the teacher says and are sometimes going to dismiss it and say, ah, the child's just, you know, hyper and he's just being a kid and he's just doing his thing. Uh, like it said, there is that possibility that he could just be really active and, and could be bored easily just due to maybe having a higher intelligence. Um, Maybe he's just not as mature as some of the other students. There's always these factors that play into it. So, and of course, there are some parents who will take the advice to heart and will actually go to the doctor and get a diagnosis done. And then it's either a yes or a no. So it's kind of... It, it's not always as simple as just going, yeah, okay it is this or it isn't this and then going and getting it done I, it it is up to the parent of course or parents to take the advice and and get the diagnosis or the assessment done or not um back in the day when i was a child like when i was five years old and starting school which was back in 1983 i my parents were not really well versed or under had any understanding or education regarding ADHD. And even my teachers, like I had the same teacher for grade one and two and at neither in any of those times did my teacher ever bring up, cause I do have my own I actually amazing. Funny enough is I have my report cards from grade one and grade two and in all the of the conversations or in all the notes that the teacher wrote and then reading the notes from my mother who was the one that always did the response there was never any discussion or any suggestion of looking at an ADHD diagnosis so it never got brought up it never was suggested and especially when there was person or like uh, on-site parent-teacher interviews when they just dis would discuss the child's progress and and if there are any issues that they're having. Not that I was necessarily like sitting there paying attention and listening to everything that was being said, of course, but 
to my recollection, there was never really anything brought up. The things that were always brought up was things like my behavior issues. Um, back when I was at that age, I had a, a really bad habit of not telling the truth. Um, I was, I guess you could, yeah, I, I had a bit of a, a miss of like a mean streak or a behavior streak where I wasn't exactly a well-behaved kid, according to the teacher and my parents obviously believed it to the, for the most part. And there were numerous attempts in the first two years of, you know, trying to make adjustments, um, more personal interaction from my parents with my schoolwork and, and I remember there were conversations that we had where I, I thought that I was being treated unfairly or I wasn't, you know, I was really trying hard and trying to do things my, like, as best that I could. And then they weren't necessarily being um, presented or appreciated in the report card that, you know, later on that year. Now, if this had been 10 years later, there's a much, there were probably would have been a much better chance they would have been brought up because the education and the knowledge or understanding of ADHD would have been a much, you know, much broader and probably a better chance that they would have brought it up to my parents. Now, an interesting fact that this, that I only learned actually let under less than two weeks ago, which is, which I had never heard of before and no, no knowledge of prior was my brother when he was in the first couple of years, like grade one and grade two. So that would have been, he's f almost four years old, younger than I am. So that would have been 1987, 88, roughly that there were a couple of teachers that had actually had brought up the suggestion of getting my brother look at diagnosed for possibly having ADHD. And I, he told me that my father dismissed it and said, no, we're not going to do that. So it, it's hard to say. I don't know now for sure if even if it had been brought up, I don't know if, if they would have taken it seriously and would have done anything about it it's possible that they could have dismissed it as easily as they did for my brother. Now, I've been around him, obviously, my entire life, and I don't know if there are really any signs necessarily that he has it. Um, if anybody has it, it's most likely I am, that I do before he does. But it was interesting to learn that, that they also recommended it to him, but that was four years later. And when I was in school, that wasn't even brought up. There was never any suggestion or recommendation of anything from my teachers. So, you know, it's different times. Today, you can pretty much bet that it would most likely be brought up because the understanding and the education of it is way better. And, you know, it's, it's something that is obviously understanding and the awareness of it is such higher today than it was back uh, in 1983. So that's nearly 40 years ago. The, you can tell the difference. Today, there's way better education, way more awareness, way more adults have it than, you know, that are diagnosed with it than it was back then. And there's more students in school or children in school that have been diagnosed with ADHD, among other disabilities like autism that I've, you know, that I've discussed in the past. So it's amazing how, f what 40 years can do when it comes to the understanding and the knowledge and the number of diagnoses um, of ADHD in that time frame. Okay, I'm going to take a break. And then when I come back, I will continue discussing the other symptoms besides ADHD. All right, talk to you soon. Another thing that uh, obviously that I need to talk about with ADHD, whether or not it is this disability, is the fact that 
There is one that for a long time, uh, autism or on ASD, or at one time it was called Asperger's, which is no longer the approved and recommended dis way of saying high functioning ASD. So a lot of people in the past, there was a belief that you couldn't be diagnosed with ADHD and autism, that it was one or the other. And it's only been recent, I think it's been the last 10 years maybe, that they've now said that you can have both autism and uh, ADHD. But sometimes it's one or the other. So it's not, it, it isn't always necessarily going to be all the same or you nece aren't necessarily going to have ADHD and or autism. So there are some obviously things that are different and, and I will discuss my own my own personal um, settings and opinions on this after I read what I'm going to read here but it's pretty straightforward so ADHD or autism okay so autism or ADHD symptoms diagnosis and treatments all right a high functioning ASD and Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder may be familiar terms for parents today. Many parents have a child with um, autism or ADHD diagnosis. Both conditions develop early in life and have similar symptoms, and they can lead to difficulties that include socializing, communication, learning, and developing. However, these symptoms develop for different reasons in autism and ADHD. A better understanding of these conditions means doctors are diagnosing more children than ever before and at earlier ages. Early diagnosis means getting treatment early, but getting a diagnosis can be challenging. What is ASD? ASD is a part of a group of neurodevelopmental conditions in the Autism Spectrum Disorder group. Autism may prevent children from socializing freely and communicating or clearly. Children with autism may develop repetitive restricted behaviors, and these behaviors include an attachment to a specific item or the need for a strict schedule. Disorders on the autism spectrum range from mild to severe. Formerly, Asperger's is a mild form, and many people with autism can lead a normal life. Behavioral therapy and counseling can help autism symptoms. What is ADHD? Well, as we already discussed, ADHD develops in childhood. Children with ADHD have trouble paying attention, focusing, and possibly learning. Some children will experience a significant decrease in symptoms as they get older, and others will continue to experience ADHD symptoms throughout their adolescent years and into adulthood. ADHD is not on the autism spectrum, and however, both ADHD and autism spectrum disorders belong to the larger category of neurodevelopmental disorders. All right, so what symptoms do autism and ADHD share? Many autism and ADHD symptoms overlap. As autism is sometimes confused with ADHD, children with either of these conditions may experience difficulty sitting still, social awkwardness and difficulty interacting with others, frequent episodes of non-stop talking, an inability to focus on things that don't interest them, impulsivity or acting on a whim. So how can you tell the difference between autism and ADHD? So although they, show, they share many symptoms, a few symptoms set autism and ADHD apart. Symptoms, symptoms specific to autism include having an all-absorbing interest in a specific focus topic such as sports, statistics, or animals. Being unable to practice nonverbal communication such as eye contact, facial expressions, or body gestures. Being unable to understand another person's feelings. Having monotone pitch or lack of rhythm when speaking. Missing motor skill development milestones such as catching a ball or bouncing a basketball. Well, I don't have that problem, clearly. Symptoms specific to ADHD include being easily distracted and forgetful, being impatient, having learning difficulties, needing to touch or play with everything, especially in a new environment, reacting without restraint or consideration for others when upset or bothered. ADHD symptoms also tend to differ between genders. 
Boys tend to be more hyperactive and inattentive, while girls are more likely to daydream or quietly not pay attention. So who is more likely to have AS, or sorry, autism and ADHD? Boys at a greater risk for developing both autism and ADHD, according to the Centers for Disease Control Prevention, or CDC. And boys are more than twice as likely as girls to develop ADHD. And autism spectrum disorders are about 4 time, 4.5 times more common in boys than girls. Yeah, that's something that I think I have discussed in a previous episode. Okay. When is autism and ADHD noticeable in children? Symptoms of autism and ADHD are present in a child's earliest years, and an early diagnosis is crucial to treating and managing the condition. Children with ADHD often aren't diagnosed until they enter a structured environment, such as a classroom. At that point, teachers and parents may begin to notice behavioral symptoms. Autism typically isn't diagnosed until a child is a bit older. The first symptom may be a delay in reaching motor skill milestones. Other symptoms, such as difficulty socializing and maintaining friendships, become more apparent as the child gets older. Both conditions are challenging to diagnose, and neither condition can be diagnosed with a single test or procedure. With autism spectrum disorders, a team of specialists must reach an agreement with about your child's condition. This team may include psychologists, psychiatrists, neurologists, and speech therapists. The team will collect and consider behavioral assessments and results from developmental speech and visual tests and first-hand accounts of interactions with your child. So how is autism and ADHD treated? Neither autism or ADHD can be cured. Treatment focuses on reducing your child's symptoms and helping them live a happy, well-adjusted life. The most common treatments for autism include therapy, counseling, and behavioral training. Although I do not recommend ABA treatment. I've gone into that already. In my uh, Literally Autistic episode of that, I've gone through that. You can check that out if you want. Medication is not commonly used. However, doctors may prescribe medication to treat other conditions that occur in children with and without autism. These conditions include depression, anxiety, and obsessive compulsive disorder. As a parent, you will see more of your child's symptoms than a doctor or therapist can in a short appointment. You can help your child and your child's healthcare providers by recording what you see. Be sure to note your child's routine, including how busy they are and how long they're away from home during the day. The structure of your child's day, for example, highly structured days or minimally structured days. Any medicines, vitamins, or supplements your child takes. Personal family information that may cause your child anxiety, such as a divorce or a new sibling. Reports of your child's behavior from teachers or child care providers. Most children with ADHD can manage symptoms with medication or behavioral therapy and counseling. A combination of these treatments can also be successful. Medication can be used to treat your child's ADHD symptoms if they interfere too much with everyday activities. Okay, so the outlook is if you suspect your child has autism, ADHD, or another developmental developmental or behavioral condition, make an appointment to see their doctor, bring notes about your child's behavior, and a list of questions for their doctor. Reaching your diagnosis for one of these conditions can take several months or even years, so be patient and act as your child's advocate so they get the help they need. And remember that each child is different. Work with your doctor to make sure your child is meeting their growth milestones. If they aren't, speak to your doctor about possible causes. Okay. So, yeah, like, autism and ADHD are so similar in a a lot of ways. But then there are clear differences that are pretty obvious when you are able to really pay attention to it and look at it, right? So... Just so you know, um, I've got to go quickly through a few things. Um, you can have uh, like anxiety um, that does look like ADHD because with anxiety, you can kind of, anxiety and stress can look like inattentiveness and hyperactivity because of the fact that your brain is thinking about it a lot. Like I know sometimes when I'm having 
stressful issues or I'm having anxiety. Like I, I'm, I feel anxiety and stress at times during my day or at, in the evening or at home or in a difficult situation. I know that sometimes it can look like ADHD symptoms, but a lot of times it can just be that you're so stressed out or you're so have so much anxiety that you're that you're dissociating or you're not grounded or you're not paying attention to anything because you're off and you're trying to to calm yourself down or you're trying to find a way to get past the anxiety or the stress. So sometimes like I'm not saying I necessarily have an anxiety disorder or anything like that. It's just a lot of times if someone does have an anxiety disorder it can really look similar a lot sim a lot like ADHD because it makes that person a lot of times look like they're not paying attention all the time or they're you know like they're just not there or they're kind of off in daydream land or whatever so it it looks like ADHD but the only way you're really going to know is you is you have to ask questions and you have to be thorough and and investigate into the into what is going on with the child's like daily life. Um, there's possibility that could be something going on at home that you're not aware of that obviously is is going on. So that's the thing. Like if you think. If you're aware of the anxiety and you have a lot of uh, you know, high anxiety levels or you got a lot of stress going on, maybe there's something that you're not aware of. Maybe you're maybe you are dealing with something like uh, past trauma. Maybe there's maybe something has happened in your life, maybe recently or maybe you know chronic from uh, years ago. That maybe maybe you're suffering from complex post traumatic stress disorder. Maybe you're not aware of it because. A lot of times that can also mimic um, like stress res uh, response or anxiety responses and often dissociate. So it looks like you're not paying attention, whether it's at school, like if you're in college and you're and you're having difficulties paying attention to the to the professor and what's going on. Um, maybe you're having difficulties paying attention at work because you're feeling a lot of anxious feelings and you're stressed out all the time. You know, that's it's a possibility. You could be dissociating, you could be zoned out and not even be aware of it. So there's, yeah, there's, there are different, definitely things, all sorts of little uh, events that could be occurring or have occurred in your life that could be mimic, mimicking uh, ADHD related symptoms. Now, if you're in it, you know, sometimes you can tell if you're in a situation where you are calm or you feel relaxed like let's say going to a movie theater and seeing a movie that you're really excited about and you're really looking forward to and maybe you just happen to notice how you're able to pay attention to it you know like you're really you're, you got good focus you're not being pulled away you're not thinking about the stress in your life maybe that right there is a sign that you don't have ADHD um, I know that, like I have discussed in previous episodes, that you can have hyper focus, where if the the task you're doing or the event that you're at or you're you're partaking in is something that you're extremely interested in or you really enjoy doing or you're very you're really talented at and that's something that you excel at, you can be hyper focused and that can include like things like art, so movies. Um, watching TV, playing video games, stuff that's that, that your mind finds exciting and and gives you a, the dopamine hit. So going to a movie and watching the movie for a few hours could be that form of hyper-focus where you're so excited and you're so into that and it's such a, um, an awesome experience for you that you focus on it so well. But at the same time, you might not be aware of other things going on or excuse me going around around you and that could be more prevalent at home if you're watching movies or tv at home and there's events going on that may or may not require your attention and you're so focused in on what you're doing with that tv show or that movie that you're not aware of anything else 
So that is that could be right there another sign and symptom that you do have ADHD. But if you if you are able to relax and you can focus on the TV or the movie and at the same time you are aware of other stuff going on like you you're let's say you're ordering dinner or you're making dinner and you're able to pull your mind away for a few seconds and and remember about oh yes I'm making dinner you know you go check it occasionally and make sure it doesn't burn you know then there's a more or a less likely possibility that that's what it is then maybe you're just dealing with stress and, and anxiousness so it's these are the kind of things that you have to take note of when you're looking at getting a diagnosis so if you're not 100 percent sure or maybe your family or your friends think that you've got adhd but you don't know for sure because there's other you know extra things that are occurring that maybe might be another diagnosis that is more likely the case it's this is the kind of thing that you have to take note and write down um have examples so when you go to do your assessment have things written down for you so that you can tell the psychologist or whoever you're or the psychiatrist uh, you're talking to for your assessment say okay so here's here's things that occur in my life you know you go through all the different things and you say yeah i can i, I can watch a movie and i'm paying attention to things or it's the opposite you know you let's say you're you're at home you could say i'm at home and i'm watching a movie and I get so drawn into the show that literally everything else around me just kind of disappears or I don't notice anything. Like you could say like my girlfriend walks around and maybe asks a question or the cat or the dog is walking and something happens and you're not even knowing, you don't have any clue that it's, I didn't have a clue that it was happening. I didn't notice it, This that something fell and I didn't hear it. Um, I was making dinner and I completely forgot about dinner as I was watching the movie and it burned on the on the stove and I ruined my dinner. And you could say that this this seems to happen on a regular basis. So right there, that's your that's your written evidence showing that doctor that this this is my explanation or my reasoning or, or belief that I am likely to have ADHD. Or if you twist it 180 degrees, that you don't think you do but you know there, there could, there's obviously many different other symptoms that occur that could be leading towards it so okay let's get to my own experiences here when it comes to why i don't you know i think i'm pretty certain that i have adhd but there are times in my day and in a week or in a month or you know whatever time frame that makes me kind of wonder if maybe i don't maybe there is something else you know you know like you, you wonder like i'm not i'm not dismissing the the possibility but you do it does make me think sometimes that it maybe is that is that chance a 30 percent chance or 20 percent chance that maybe there's other something else that's going on that is masking or, or mimicking the ADHD. So I have, I've always struggled in my life with things like social situations, um, trying to meet new people and make new friends, um, social gatherings. Um, now I can't necessarily say with my family because it's slightly different. Like there are things that occur with my family that are like autistic symptoms, but there's a different, there's also a different feeling. Like it's, it's closer. There's more, you know, more trust, more respect and more, uh, you have a, you feel more comfortable in these situations. So, I, I will kind of go on that briefly, but the first thing is with strangers or people that I don't really know well, or know, but don't know if you get along with them or trust them kind of thing. So yeah, I, as I, when I grew up and I was in school, there were, there were things that I 
I did and my behaviors that were kind of unusual that wouldn't necessarily be typical for a kid in uh, like ages six, seven, eight, ten, twelve kind of thing. And a lot of the, the odd symptoms were like constant talking, um, routines being disruptive, uh, like not being able to communicate properly, like going, like discussing something, uh, I guess the best, the best obvious example that I can come up with was in school, we'd have like the teacher would discuss a topic. So the topic could be anything. We'll just say like a social studies topic. And so we're talking about Canada or the history, like things that were going on in the past. And everybody, of course, would have questions or they would have their opinions or would or want us to ask a question or make a statement about something that they've read or they heard. And I often had wanted to have my own opinion on something or comment or ask a question. And my biggest issue was I didn't know how to word it. I didn't know how to present what I was saying to the teacher or the class to make sense or to, to it, like you, you want it to be brief and concise and get to the point. Like, and you wanted your information to, to be like seen as important and clear because obviously you know, you want to get a, you're trying to get an answer. You're trying to get a response to confirm or to refute something that you're saying. And you obviously don't want to have the teacher standing there for 10 minutes as you're going on and on and on repeating things and, and saying stuff that makes no sense or that has nothing to do with the topic. And I remember a number of times in school where I would be put, I'd put my hand up and the teacher would ask and I would start talking and it, it sounded at first like it was going well. And then, you know, I would have a hard time making the point. Uh, the information that I was providing to the class would be like vague or, or not make sense. And I didn't necessarily always know in my mind as I was doing it, as I was presenting the information to the class, that it wasn't making sense or that I wasn't getting my point across. But at times that I realized as the conversation's going on and I can hear in the background, like the groans and the sighs from the class because it's taking forever. It's, it's the point's not getting across. He seems like he's dragging on. He's just blah, blah, blah. And I would notice this and I'd be getting like like frustrated and kind of losing my cool a little because I would be like trying to get my point across and I wouldn't get the response or the, or the look from the teacher would be one of like, Oh geez, get to the point. You know, you're, you're dragging on blah. You know, you just, it's like you're circling and you're not getting anywhere. And I, so I would start to drag away and I, or I would change slightly what I'm saying, or I would add something new into it to think, oh, if, well, okay, this obviously isn't working, so I gotta grab some more information that I think in my brain is relevant or important to the conversation that I'm just, like, that I'm talking about, and I would add it in. And a lot of times it would just kind of, would do nothing but hurt, it like cause more conflict or more complications to what I was talking about. And there were a lot of times where the teacher would end up just cutting me off and you know like because they just they couldn't take it any longer and so it would it would get to the point where i remember classmates would be either snickering in the background or laugh or the, or you could see them rolling their eyes going oh my god here he goes again and i didn't have the the knowledge and the understanding or the intelligence to well maybe intelligence isn't the right word um the logic or the ability to notice that i there was something i wasn't doing right or i couldn't get my point across um and it i often and the result of this a lot of times was i would feel like i was being made fun of i would get bullied and so 
it was like traumatizing to a large degree because of the fact that I was thinking that these this my classmates didn't like me they wouldn't they they thought I was an idiot or the, or thought I was dumb or and they wanted nothing to do with me because they saw that I was just some opinionated guy or a kid in school talking about something and it would make no sense and that I would just be very opinionated and difficult or stubborn or like stick to my guns and I wouldn't be able to be you know like I could not be persuaded to change my opinion. Sometimes it did, not often, but more often than not, I would like stick to my opinion or stick to what I was saying. And so people saw that as being like selfish or, or, or opinionated or, or ridiculous. And so, yeah, I got made fun of. Um, I could, I always remember hearing laughter or the groans or the, or somebody would say something that was mean. And, you know, you, you go through the years of repeatedly having this and nobody even not, and, and this is this, the worst part is that nobody at any point throughout those years brought it up or said something to myself or to my parents saying, something's not right. You know, there's, he, this is a repeating thing, um, not making sense, uh, having a difficult time getting your point across, communication skills are lacking. And that was what was occurring all the time, or, or most of the time during school. So that, and the, but the thing is, is I also had a problem where I was, I, I get bored awful fast when I was in school. Like it, it, and it wasn't necessarily because I already knew the information or I was super smart because I'm not necessarily, I wouldn't consider myself an extremely intelligent or, or, or a very intelligent person. And I did struggle in school. Now, whether or not that is because of my disabilities that I have is something that is yet to be confirmed or, or debated really. Although I have a feeling that's probably the case, but yeah, like I had a lot of inattentive issues. I was very hyperactive. I could, I had a hard time sitting still in school or I'd, or I'd get distracted very easily by whatever I was, what was going on. Like it could just be something in my mind literally that would, would come up. And so I would start thinking about it or I would think about the football game later on that week, or I would think about playing when I was at my, the hockey that that evening or, or football or or all I would care about thinking about was was going home after school because I didn't want to be at school you know so there was a large range of of things that would get in the way and sometimes it would just be where I would be reading the book like we'd have our textbook out and I would be reading the textbook and I'd, and I'd be skipping ahead pages and going through like I'd be two three pages and I wouldn't be reading every single word I'd be kind of finding things that were kind of cool or interesting and I would read that and then I'd get I'd get so distracted that I would lose track or I wouldn't realize where they were and there were times I remember where I'd get called upon to read from the book and I would I wouldn't be prepared because I wasn't following along and I'd go, oh, oh, where are we? You know, and of course you'd hear the laughter, the giggling in the background because, oh, look at Russ. He's, he hasn't, he's not paying attention. He's, he looks stupid again, or it looks like he's goofing off. So yeah, you know, um, so there was, uh, I had a lot of that. Um, it was, it was extremely obvious, like my learning my, my inability to learn and understand and like, I comprehend things, especially in like my English courses, uh, pretty much throughout all life. Um, I, I've never really had a great grasp on proper grammar techniques and writing technique and ability, like, you know, doing essays. I was, you might as well have just scratched me off. I was, I'd either barely pass or I wouldn't. And it, and it, I don't think I rarely, if I could, I, it's the memory is not exactly clear, but 
I don't know if I ever really wrote an essay where I had a, a great score. Like the thought and the information that I would put down on paper, if if it wasn't a grammar and writing uh, grade, if it was st strictly on information and understanding and knowledge of what you're talking about, I probably would have gotten really decent grades. But they're most, of course, they're looking for grammar and structure and writing skills. That's what they're grading you on. And that was never really my, I, I never, that was not my strong point ever in school. So, um, it's, it was, so there's, it, it was both basically. Um, it was ADHD related issues that were coming up and also autistic related problems. Now the autism probably played more, a bigger role in the social aspect in school rather than the. I'm not saying it didn't, but it, it it's it did play a role in the learning aspect. But it was probably more, a, a, you know, a, a parent in the social related aspects with with my classmates. Um, I I didn't know how to properly interact with classmates. Um, I didn't I didn't know how to to see or understand if if someone was upset if they were being sarcastic with me if they were joking if they were being serious or sincere like there were all these things that would occur that i didn't really have the ability to catch or to understand or to be aware of so i was i would be clueless and that again led to you know me being seen in school as an outcast rather than someone who could be included in events. I recall how many times we'd be in a class and we'd have to do a group, uh, like a group project. So there'd be two or three of us that would have to, I don't know, write, do some sort of little mini write up or and then a presentation. And I recall a number of times where they would put us together. And of course I wouldn't, I, I was at a point where I just didn't bother to, to ask because I, I automatically felt that they, would, they wouldn't want to. They had no desire to, to be with me as a, as a partner. You know, it was like one of those things where just going, yeah, right. And it was, there was proof because I remember when the teacher would say, okay, uh, you and you and Russ, you're one group. And there would be... Like they wouldn't always do it, but I remember looking at them and they would groan or they would, they would roll their eyes or they would, you know, they wouldn't, they would be unhappy at the fact that they had to be a partner with me in their, in the project. Uh, can you imagine what that would do? Like it, that, that was hurtful to me because I already felt like I didn't belong and that I wasn't part of the group. And then you get one of your classmates who gets told that you have to be a partner with me and is not shy on expressing their displeasure with the fact that they had to be. So I felt hurt and I felt like, angry that, well, just because I'm me doesn't mean that we're not going to do well or that we're not going to get along. So they, you know, they'd force themselves to do it and we'd get it done and you know, I, I don't really have specific memories of it, but I just remember that classmates would would f openly display their displeasure with the fact that they had to be together with me as a, as in a partnership doing a project. And, yeah, that was pretty hurtful. Uh, so, yeah, like the social aspect... There, you can have some ADHD related things that come up because you can be extremely hyperactive and very inattentive, you know, limited ability to focus on the person. Like, you know, you can't pay attention. You're having a hard time paying attention to what they're saying, um, easily distracted by things around you. So you you suddenly lose the ability to focus on what's going on. Like they're talking to you and they're expecting you to be listening to them. 
And especially if they're asking you like something and they, they want a response and because you get distracted and something catches your mind and you're not thinking about the conversation and, or you're like half there and they ask you and then you're, they're standing there or they're sitting there and they're waiting for you to respond. And you know, I, I'd be like, huh? Oh, what was that? You know, and of course that, that would obviously make them go, Oh geez. You know, they, they, they'd grown or they'd in their mind. I'm sure they were thinking, Oh my God, he's, he's such an idiot. So, but that thing is, is that can, that can be autism too, but in a, cause you don't understand, like you're not able to understand the, the social rules of one-on-one -on -one conversations or group related, uh, interactions and, the etiquette of, of behavior. So things that you do that you don't realize in the moment are incorrect or, or misbehaving or, or selfish looking or appear selfish to other people, they pick up on that immediately. And if, and especially if you're repeating this day after day, they soon start to go, this guy just he's he's stupid or he's he doesn't care about anybody or he's, he's so selfish or he thinks about himself only and they very quickly create an opinion about you and it's especially at that age it's very difficult to change their minds you know they're 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 going to have an opinion they're going to they're going to make a judgment about who you are and unless you do some really crazy, amazing thing that is like so unique or special or whatever, the odds are pretty well against you that you're never going to convince that person to change how they think about you, how they feel about you. And I know that I was already at a disadvantage in many ways when I went to school, but whether or not a lot of it was ADHD especially when I grew up and in, you know, as you, as you move into the real world and you get a job and you, or you go to school, like to college and you, and you have to earn your degree or your certificate or your diploma to, to continue improving and edu your education and increasing your chances for a higher paying job and being more, you know, better off in life all these things start to to show especially when you're you're expected to be an like a normal or a neurotypical adult in front of people and you're not um that's the thing is i i'm sure a lot of you feel the same is unless you've been officially diagnosed, like if you 100% have been told, yes, you fit all the, all the proper method, you know, like the standard there, I think it's like seven. I, I remember early on reading about this. There's just so many symptoms that you have to portray and, and display to the, like to people and to the psychiatrist who's doing the assessment that, you have to you have to hit or you have to be have in order for them to diagnose you with ADHD you if if you're unless you've been diagnosed and you're not sure about it and you believe that you might have other issues maybe you've got bipolar disorder type 2 or or maybe you suffer from depression maybe you are an OC like OCD um, maybe you're autistic, you know, maybe you're high functioning and these similar symptoms are occurring in, in front of people, you start to second guess yourself. You start to, and it, and it causes stress and it causes, uh, internally anxiety, not just in, in regular every day, but in social related situations where you are afraid to interact with people and talk to people strangers and and friends and on a on just in general because you are you don't have self-confidence in yourself you're also worried that you're going to act in a funny weird way to, at these people 
and they're going to think of you as kind of odd or, or maybe they think you're stupid or maybe they think you're being selfish or you're antisocial. Like there's all these things that kind of play in and it leads to, you know, feel not feeling confident about yourself, feeling bad about yourself, um, worrying you're going to be alone, that no one's going to really care about you because every time you try to play, you know, be interactive with anybody, you try to get into social situations, you fail miserably. So you end up isolating yourself. Uh, you either don't go to any uh, social events, like you don't go to parties, you don't go to dances, you don't go to weddings, you don't do anything. You never go out to meet people because you feel scared and, you know, you have major social anxiety to do anything with anybody because you think you're going to, they're going to find out that you have ADHD or you have autism and they're going to create, they're going to have an, an, an immediate opinion. They're going to, they're going to create an opinion about you immediately and they're going to dismiss you or they're going to want nothing to do with you. So these repeated events of people dismissing you and thinking that you're not smart or that you're, you're a loser or that you're selfish and so on, it, it, it adds up and you get to the point where you just start to isolate and you don't care. You just, you're going to, you figure you're better off being by yourself and not putting yourself out there because you just know it's going to happen again the next time you go out. And so now you're developing like, either you're developing social anxiety or you've from your past ex, like in your childhood or adolescence, you, you develop, um, childhood, like, sorry, CPTSD and you're experiencing flashbacks and triggers to events where you were bullied and made fun of and neglected and abandoned. Like it, it's, it gets so complicated and it piles on. It, it's a wonder that, you know, like if, unless you're a really strong person and you, and you have the will power and strength to, to push on despite all of that, there's a lot of us. And I'm sure a lot of you out there that feel scared to do anything, to, to put out, put yourself out there, to, to try and make new friends, to, to start a relationship with someone, um, Maybe it, it gets to the part where you're afraid to go to school or you're afraid to find a new job. Uh, you're afraid to interact with your family. You know, like all these things will could be affected in your life because of, of, because of your ADHD or, or your autism or some other s diagnosis that you're dealing with. Maybe you've, hey, you never know. Maybe you've had dyslexia for your entire life and you're not aware of it and you can't you don't you're having you have such a difficult time reading uh, a book because everything looks scrambled and doesn't look right to you so maybe think maybe your classmates made fun of you because you can't read properly or because you have the dyslexia and it's amazing how that something like that can be so detrimental to someone's psyche and to their self-confidence and if it's repeating and they're experiencing flashbacks to those situations, it can be extremely harmful to a person to do any, literally anything. And you, you get to the point where the only call, only thing that could help is therapy and learn to, you know, like if it's, if it's complex trauma, then you've got to do the, like, like the way I do it with structural dissociation theory and you do processing and you, and you, you find out you've got child parts that are trying to protect you, but they're also getting triggered. So they're preventing you from doing adult related, um, activities with your friends or even making friends or going and doing your jobs, you know, so you gotta, you gotta deal with that. And then if, if you do know you have autism or, or you've been diagnosed with ADHD, you have to get out. You have to, you have to find ways to work with it, you know, like accept that you've got your diagnosis, accept that you have ADHD or your autism and get out there and 
find all the different ways to help reduce the symptoms, right? Like it, maybe you need to change your diet. Maybe you need to try and sleep better. Maybe you need to exercise more, you know, build up the self-confidence, build up the, the ability to adapt to, to knowing that your ADHD causes certain um, symptoms to occur in certain daily occurrence, they daily life situations, and you need to adapt to, to minimize what occurs. And it takes, obviously, you know, it takes time, but I'm kind of dragging on here a bit. Um, so I, I will wrap that up basically. So yeah, um, you may, unless you have your diagnosis for ADHD, for those who are looking into it and want to get a diagnosis, whether it is to to say, yes, I have ADHD or to find something, maybe you have a different diagnosis that you're not aware of uh, or, or a different disability. Maybe you you know, you could have autism. You could be uh, experiencing bipolar disorder. Maybe you have OCD. Maybe you, Maybe it's nothing, maybe it isn't any of that at all right like i was like i said earlier when i was reading all these things maybe it isn't something like that maybe it's it's as simple as you've got a a different disorder that is un, you're not aware of right like maybe you're just you know there's all sorts of things out there that you could possibly be dealing with that you're not aware of um and the change, you know, if the, if the doctor gets, is able to show you that diagnosis of something that is more, is very helpful for you, you might have the chance of improving your life. Like you could have a sleep disorder. You could have a sensory disorder. You could have low blood sugar, you know, like you might, you may just have something that could be worked on just from education or from repetitive therapy it, it, it could be as simple as that but is it is important to get an assessment done because even if it isn't adhd they're going to find they, they could very well find something else that is important to help you get a to become more have a better regulated li uh, lifestyle um take care of the anxiety and the stress you know it it's complicated it is not an easy thing to get a, an assessment because it isn't always clear and but it's important if you'd get that done then you have a better chance of having more success at, at your work or with it in a relationship uh, with your family paying rent or owning a house all these things add up to improving your abilities to live a day-to-day -day life as an adult all right that's it for this episode um it is a bit long but it was important to discuss everything that i brought up in today's episode if you would like to get in touch with me if you have any questions or you want to make uh, a statement or something regarding something i've said or you just want to have a chat uh, you can contact me uh, at Twitter. My handle is at ADHD and CPTSD. You can go to the website, uh, www.livingwithadhdncptsd.ca, and you can contact me there. Um, I am extremely glad that I get to do this for everybody who's dealing with ADHD uh, or even autism, uh, CPTSD all sorts you know different different uh disabilities and diagnoses that are out there if you really find these podcasts helpful and supportive in your uh, goal of trying to make your life better for yourself then you could help me out give me a tip or a donation uh, go to coffee.com ko-fi.com and look for living with adhd and cptsd and you can do a monthly amount or you could do a one-time donation if you feel like it. Yeah. Um, all right. So those who are listening to CPTSD episodes, uh, my, I will have one that comes out tomorrow in the morning. And 
I look forward to having you listen to that one as well. All right, everybody. Talk to you next week. Bye.